Chicago, Illinois, one of the giants of industry among the cities of the world. The heart of all shipping on the Great Lakes. A colossus of big business and finance. A city of gaiety with a legion of fine restaurants, theaters, and nightclubs. Millions of workers, a high percentage of them, members of various unions and guilds. Most of these unions are decent and honest, working in behalf of their members. Some are not. State's Attorney's Office. My name is Pardis. Mickey Pardis. No, Mr. Fremont wouldn't know me. Just tell him this is important. Very important. Mr. Fremont, Mickey Pardis. I'm the treasurer of the Workers' National Brotherhood. Mr. Fremont, I have to see you. I have evidence that proves racketeers are trying to take over our union. Yes. Yes, it's in a set of books I kept. No, I can't come to your office. How about your house? Tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I'll bring the books, everything. But you've got to keep my name out of it. Now, this is confidential. Understand? Confidential. Okay. Tonight. On the night of May the 6th, the treasurer of the Workers' National Brotherhood, a man named Mickey Pottis, was bound for an important meeting at the home of James Fremont, state's attorney for Cook County, Illinois. Partis was supposed to meet that same night with the president of the Workers' National Brotherhood, Arthur Blaine. We should have heard from Mickey by now, Laura. 
Well, maybe call when we're on our way back from my apartment. Maybe. Those books are dynamite. I shouldn't have let Mickey handle it. I should have done it myself. Artie, Artie, you couldn't. Harrison's had you watched like a hawk. He's had this office wired, your house covered. He knows every move you make. Mickey and I have been together a long time. I know. Came up through the ranks together. Long time. Laura, I could have fought harder in that election. I might have turned enough votes away from Harrison so he'd never been vice president. You couldn't know he was going to sell out the way he did? Honey, it's my business to know what goes on here. Artie, look, will you stop blaming yourself? Now, look, when this is over, we're going to get married and take that trip to Europe. Well? What do you want here, Harrison? We better have a talk. I'll be in my apartment. Call me. Sure. Good night, Laura. What do you want? You made a mistake. You shouldn't have sent Mickey to the state's attorney. You know that. You had your chance, Hardy. We wanted to include you. Now it's too late. Include me in what? Robbing my own union? Stealing over a half a million dollars from the welfare fund? There's no proof of that. Isn't there? Mickey kept another set of books. Books that you never saw. We saw them. All right. There's other evidence. Evidence of how you and your thugs force manufacturers to permit betting books and numbers to operate right in their own plants. Signed statements of how you are setting up a vice operation, importing B-girls and making them work in every saloon in this town. There's no proof of anything. Anything, understand? And if you're counting on the state's attorney, don't. Where's Mickey Pardos? There you are, Artie. $50,000. It's all yours. Take it and start running. Running? You're not going to be around here for the union election in June. I'm going to run the WNB. Not you. You think you can get rid of me with this? You have your choice. Take it and get out of the country in the next seven hours or stay here and take whatever happens. Get out, Harrison. Get out. You can still make it, Artie. Seven hours. You won't have any longer than that. Remember, you had your chance. Where's Mickey? What have you done with him? Mickey. Mickey never got to Fremont. Mickey's dead. It's a shame. Somebody caught up with him, I guess. Somebody who didn't like him. Doesn't pay to make the wrong kind of enemies. Meanwhile, on the dock where Mickey Partis was killed, the accidental presence of an old derelict known as Candy Mouth Duggan was destined to have a decided effect on the infiltration of gangsterism into Chicago's labor union structure. morning, the murder was discovered. But the unidentified body recovered from the submerged car gave no immediate indication of the importance of the case. What about the gun? Smith and Wesson, huh? You check the registration? Okay, Mac, get on it and get back to me. Oh, Captain. 
Ballistic says the bullet was fired from a 22 Smith & Wesson long rifle. What do you got? Well, this is the left thumb from a guy by the name of Mickey Partis. Uh -huh. And this is the left thumbprint for the body. Now, see these three contraforks? Yeah. One above the other, huh? Yeah, both the same. Yeah. Well, the dead guy's Partis, all right. Any record? Oh, just normal classification. A uh, union executive, treasurer. Union? Yeah, the WNB. Notify the state's attorney's office. That's where I'll be if you want anything else. Okay. Hi, Jake. Yeah? Well, call me back, will you? And that mob of newspaper guys outside looks like you're onto a hot one. Harder than I want. How do you figure it? You know, the rackets are operating on the unions in other cities. Yeah. Blackmail, prostitution, dope gambling. They don't miss any bets. That's right. That's why Mickey Partos was coming to see me last night. See you? He told me the mob was taking over his union. He was bringing me evidence to prove it. What kind of axe was Partos grinding? I don't know. He was after somebody. Artie Blaine? The head man? Maybe. Can't just be the local guys pulling this off. We ran the syndicate mugs out of Chicago long ago. It looks like they're coming right back through the unions, doesn't it? And all we got is a stiff from the morgue and the fact that the murder weapon was a Smith & Wesson. Yeah, without Parto's evidence, I'm a dead duck. So, I'll make an investigation of Blaine and the rest of the union top brass. Just be a lot of questions and phony answers. Right. The only wedge we got, Jake, is to find the guy that killed Mickey Parto's. So get a hold of that gun, will you? We'll bear down. And Jake, listen. No? I don't have to tell you how important this is, do I? Sure. We could wake up tomorrow and find the United States doesn't own Chicago anymore. That same morning in the home of Alan Dixon, a disbarred lawyer and once one of the masterminds of the old Capone gang, Another meeting took place concerning the gun that killed Mickey Partos. The gun should have been put in the car with Partos, not on the dock. But we'll locate it, Mr. Dixon. I want the police to locate it. That's why we planted it. The word's out in all the joints we control. It'll turn up and we'll make sure that the police get it. We have nothing until the Partos killing is hung on Blaine. Just remember that. Well, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. By getting rid of Blaine instead of Partos. Killing Blaine wouldn't have killed the votes of the men who back him. If Blaine goes to jail for murder, it means that all of his loyal supporters will go down with him. None of them will stand a chance of being elected to office. That's how you'll get to be elected WNB president. Yeah. Well, you're running the show. Keep that in mind. That's the way the syndicate wants it. We've only started to build our organization in this town. The day Blaine's convicted, we'll go into high gear. Find that gun. I don't want to hear from you till you do. Stink up the joint. How many times have I told you? You want a handout, go to the back door. Please, Milt, just one. Short one. Milt, Milt. Straight, Milt. Skip the ice and I'll pay you tomorrow. Oh, sure. Only tomorrow never gets here. Milt, please. Listen, you still owe me a week's rent for that dump you live in upstairs. You're supposed to be working here. This ain't no charity home. Milt, you can trust me. You're not supposed to drink. You're just supposed to make the customers thirsty. Please, Milt. All right, but this is the last one. Thanks. Yeah. You still here? 
Oh, so now you're going to knock over the place. I found it, Milt. The other night, in the dock. You understand? The other night. Yeah, I think you latched on to something, Candy Mouth. Must be worth a lot to somebody, huh, Milt? Maybe somebody like Artie Blaine, huh? Maybe I could get it to him, huh? Maybe I could get back in the Union. What do you say, Milt? Will you help me? Yeah, I'll help you. Help yourself. Come on, drink up. We talk to Harrison. Yeah, it's important, very important. Tom, it's Milt. Mr. Harrison? I think I've got something you're looking for. Thanks. Here's to you, mate. Found it on the pier. Who was it? Used to be a member of the WNB years ago. But they threw him out for hitting the bottle. What did he see? I don't know, but he's in the bank. Come in, have a drink. Milt said you found this on the pier the other night after Partis was killed. That's right. What else did you see? Uh, nothing. <coughs> all I seen was a gun, that's all. Nothing else. You didn't see a car. I told you. That's all I see. It's nothing else. Nothing. Yeah, you told me. On your feet. On your feet. Once more. I'll never remember it, I tell you. I've, I got trouble remembering things. We'll try once more. You know what'll happen to you if you don't go through with this. I was... I was out taking a walk. Getting some air. And this car drives out on the pier, right? That's right. Artie Blaine was driving it. And then, uh, then, uh, <laughs> don't tell me, huh? And then, oh, yeah, he got out and he, 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 he started uh, looking around for something, see? He was looking for that gun, see? I remembered it, I did just like you said, didn't I? Finish it. Well, Blaine didn't find the gun, and after he left, I, I wonder what he's looking for, so... I did some looking around myself, and that's how come I, I found it. I... It's beginning to penetrate. And when Fremont questions you about your drinking, what'll you tell him? I ain't had a drink in weeks, right? Work with him all night if you have to, and get him a bath and some clothes. And then the final step in the morning, make sure the police locate Blaine's car. Jim, we got something. A car that pushed Partis off the dock. Bumper marks, scratches, paint, they all match. The car's in the name of Artie Blaine. You think Blaine did it himself? Why not? Maybe he couldn't trust anybody else. He's your pigeon, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's what Partos wanted to tell me. The car was reported stolen a week ago, but Blaine could have had that set up. 
Yeah. Something here in the Pardos case that might interest you, Mr. Fremont. Come on in, Evans. Mr. Fremont. Hi. Mr. Duggan here saw Blaine on the pier the other night. He also found this. It's registered to Blaine, and it's the murder weapon. Ballistics report. Mr. Duggan's statement. Thank you. Sit down, will you, Mr. Duggan? Thanks. Black and white. Let Blaine try to wiggle out of this one. Mr. Duggan, it says here that you recognize Blaine. That's right. How did you know him? I used to belong to the WNB. I've seen Artie Blaine lots of times. You hang around the docks a lot? Well, look at friends there. They, they give me jobs now and then. What are you questioning me for? I come here to help you. Well, it's just a formality, Mr. Duggan. No reason for you to be frightened. <laughs> Who's frightened? How long has it been since you had a drink? Liquor? Yeah. Oh, weeks. I ain't had a drink for weeks. Well, I think Mr. Duggan is going to be able to help us. Pick up Blaine, will you, Jake? Relax your half. Look, Fremont. I'm not going to give you any song and dance. That's what you get from everybody you arrest. I'm leveling with you. I'm being framed and you're falling for it. It was your gun, your car, and you were seen by a witness. Do you think I'd kill Mickey? I'm the guy that was sending him to you without evidence. Blaine, if you've got any defense, you can use it in court. You won't listen. No. OK. I'll be able to sleep nights. Hey. Well, good evening. Hi. Well, what are you doing up? I thought you were going to be asleep by now. All good wives wait up for their husbands. Oh, yeah. Been working on the case? Nope. Now, if you intend for that to sound mysterious, it does. Uh, I was thinking maybe we ought to move out of this place. I think it's getting a little stuffy. Well, stuffy? Yeah, compared to the governor's mansion. You know. Jim, you're not serious. Those political boys that came to see me tonight were serious. Biggest wheels in the state, sweetie. They tell me the nomination is a cinch. But why now, all of a sudden? A trial. According to them, if I convict Blaine, I'm as good as elected. Oh, honey, this is wonderful. Wonderful. That's all we ever worked for. Well, the hard work's just beginning. Well, it's not work stamping out a mess like that corruption in the WNB. Or putting guys like Artie Blaine where they belong. Boy, will that get you the union vote. Well, I mean it. That's not supposed to be a campaign speech. It's not bad, though, is it? Terrific. Honest James Fremont, the people's choice. Shall we drink on it? Make it long and tall and cool. By the morning of the third day, the evidence that had piled up against Blaine seemed to give State's Attorney Fremont an airtight case. That afternoon, Blaine's attorney produced two surprise witnesses in Blaine's defense. The first of these was Laura Barton. Now, you say Mr. Blaine came to your apartment to discuss plans for your marriage next month. What time did he arrive there? Right after a business call he made, 9 o'clock. Just how do you fix the time so accurately? Mr. Blaine had just gotten in when the 9 o'clock news came on television. Did either of you see or talk to any other person? Yes. I made a late dinner, but I forgot to buy cigarettes. So Artie, I mean Mr. Blaine, called to Sylvia Clarkson. And who is Miss Clarkson? 
She has the apartment next to mine. It's around the corner of the light well. I can, I can call to her from my window. And uh, what did Mr. Blaine say? Well, as near as I can remember, he said, uh, if you can spare them, Sylvia, bring over a couple of packs. And what did Sylvia say? She said, uh, sure thing, Mr. Blaine, or something like that. She brought them to the door, and I took them. Now, Miss Barton, you have stated that Mr. Blaine came to your apartment at 9 o'clock. What time did he leave? 11. 11 o'clock. Now, let me ask you again, and let me remind you that you are under oath. During those two hours, did Mr. Blaine leave the apartment at any time? He did not. Thank you. The second of the surprise witnesses was Sylvia Clarkson, a nightclub singer who substantiated for the defense what Laura Barton had testified. Her testimony severely damaged the case presented by James Fremont. One of the sensations of the trial was the move by Emery Morgan, counsel for the defense, in presenting two new witnesses, Laura Barton and Sylvia Clarkson. When Miss Barton took the stand, she was asked. Jim, Sylvia Clarkson, could her testimony have been bought? Well, I don't know about her. Money could be that important to her. Just don't feel that way about Laura Barton. She's very much in love with Blaine. Wouldn't that be incentive enough for her to perjure herself? You would feel that way about her, wouldn't you? Hello. Yeah, Jake. A tape recorder. Where'd you find it? Yeah. Well, look, meet me at the office. Yeah, yeah, I'll leave right now. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Heard that, didn't you? Are you really going down to the office? Got to, honey. Well, can't it wait till morning? Oh, Jake's turned up some new evidence. Mm. I was going to make a liar out of Laura Barton. No way to... The prosecution quickly established that the tape recorder belonged to Laura Barton and had been given to her by Blaine ten days before the murder of Mickey Parkers. I'll ask you to listen to this voice and tell me if you recognize it. Hate to bother you, Seal, but we ran out of cigarettes. If you can spare them, lend us a couple of packs. You recognize the voice, Miss Barton? I don't know. Miss Barton, isn't it true that Arthur Blaine made that recording prior to the night of the murder? No. And you used it to deceive Miss Clarkson and establish an alibi for Blaine when he went out to kill Mickey Partos? That's not true. He did leave your apartment before 11 o'clock that night, didn't he? No, he didn't. And then you played that recording to make the girl next door think he was still there. That's a lie. But he'd already gone out, hadn't he? He didn't come back for an hour. That's what happened that night, Miss Barton, isn't it? No, it isn't. He was there. He was there all the time. The tape recorder completely discounted the testimony of Laura Barton. There remained but one more witness who had to be eliminated, Sylvia Clarkson. Okay. That's a sample of what it's like. Now, tomorrow, you're going back to answer questions for Fremont. You're going to remember it different. You never saw blame that night. You're going to say you made a mistake when you said you saw Blaine in Laura Barton's apartment. Right. You be a good girl. We don't bother you no more.
complete shattering of the Blaine defense came when Sylvia Clarkson admitted that it might have been Blaine's recorded voice she'd heard, and that she probably only thought she'd seen Blaine in Laura Barton's apartment that night. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The defendant will rise and face the bar. What is your verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant, Arthur Blaine, guilty of murder in the first degree, as charged. Court stands adjourned. <laughs> The last obstacle's been removed. Everybody's happy. Everybody except Blaine, of course. We get complete control of the WNB. Fremont gets to be governor. The Union gets a complete whitewashing. And even the ones who are forced to go along with our little enterprise stand to make more money. Airline charter's all arranged? Just completed the last one today, from Miami to Havana. Good. Then we are ready to start servicing our foreign customers. I'm going to give you a file of all of our accounts in foreign countries. They'll pay high prices for American girls. You select the girls. Arrange all the necessary papers. Right. It's a clear route from you, Harrison. Clear and well paid. We can start to spread out now. Send out orders all the way down the line. Get started. I'll get on it first thing tomorrow. Today. Okay. With the conviction of Arthur Blaine, the racketeer element in the WNB began to widen its activities. All manufacturers dealing with the Union were terrorized into allowing bookie and numbers rackets to operate in their factories. Bars were forced to put B-girls to work, making the proprietors part of the vice racket, whether they wanted it or not. And the girls, as well as the proprietors, had to pay off weekly to Union collectors. Every worker in the entire membership received quiet threats. Contribute to the Ken Harrison Union Election Fund or suffer the consequences. All this was accomplished with the efficiency of men who knew how to use terror as a threat. And the more terror existed, the less the police had to go on. There wasn't one bit of evidence or testimony that could trace the violence to the workers' national brotherhood. And Fremont has done a monumental job in striking at the very heart of racketeering in unions. The so-called executives who run them. Are you listening? I read it twice. You know, you'll be the youngest governor the state ever had. Well, Jake, I want to get elected. I wouldn't kid you about that. I'm not kidding myself either. I did a lot of soul searching on myself about this. And it's not just ambition. I really believe that my idea is to help the state. You know, I told... Yeah. Miss Barton's here, sir. Send her in, will you? Laura Barton? Yeah, she's called up every day since the trial ended. Brother, they never give up. Want me to leave? No, stick around. She's probably going to start calling me names. Maybe you'll pick up some new ones. Come in, Miss Barton. You know Captain Parker? Sit down, please. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Mr. Fremont, you made a mistake about Artie Blaine. Well, that makes 13 of us, doesn't it? There were 12 people on the jury. Artie was with me that night. He couldn't have killed Mickey Partos. We've been all through that. Mr. Fremont, listen to me. You listen to me, Miss Barton. Every time a man is convicted, a lot of friends and relatives show up here. They scream that the guilty man has been railroaded or framed or beaten up by the police to get a confession. But they never have a shred of evidence to back up that accusation. Now, if you can show me some new evidence, Miss Barton, I'll listen to you. Mr. Fremont, that wasn't a trial. The public convicted Artie before that trial began. 
You and the public and the newspapers, you just crucified him. You and your investigation of the unions. Look, if you're really interested in getting the thieves in the unions, then why don't you get the right men? What do you want to do? Find out the truth after he's been executed. You through? No, I'm not. That wasn't Artie Blaine's voice you heard on that tape recorder. It had to be somebody else's. I know, because Artie Blaine was with me. Even, even your own witness established the time when Mickey Pardos was killed. And at that time, Artie Blaine was with me. Miss Blaine, I'm a public servant, and I'm paid to see that justice is done. I wish I could convince you of that. Well, you're not going to convince me of that until Artie goes free. All right, I'll see what I can do to convince you, Jake. Get a man from Polygraph for the tape recorder, will you? What are you going to do? I'll try to prove to you that was Blaine's voice you heard on the recording. Evans. Yes, sir? Get the head man at Writer's Sound Research, please. Yes, sir. This is a busy office, Miss Borton. You're wasting time with this demand. Now, I don't mind having a killer like Artie Blaine on my conscience, but I don't want you on my conscience. Are you afraid of the truth, Mr. Fremont? I'll be waiting to hear from you. Brother. They just never give up. Mind telling me what this is all about? Well, Laura Barton seems to think that you got shortchanged. So we're going to see that you get your money's worth. You mean she found some new evidence? Now, why don't you level with yourself, Blaine? What could she possibly find? And what are you doing here? Just come to dig my grave a little deeper? All set, Mr. Fremont. Give me the mic. What is this? You speak clearly into the mic and say this. Please. What for? Yes, I am. Hate to bother you, Sill, but we ran out of cigarettes. Start again. Hate to bother you, Sill, but we ran out of cigarettes. If you can spare them, lend us a couple of packs. Okay, Martin. We better make another one to be sure. A little louder this time. Hate to bother you, Sill, but we ran out of cigarettes. If you can spare them, lend us a couple of packs. Okay. All right, I did what you wanted. Now, what was it for? Laura Barton wants proof that you're innocent, so we're going to let the sound laboratory prove that uh, you're not. We're all ready, Jim. Just waiting for you to get here. Dr. Charney's going to run the test for us himself. Doctor. Hello, Mr. Fumont. How are you today? Right, thanks. Now, look, we can't leave any room for doubt on this, Doctor. Is this a conclusive test? The results will be positive, Mr. Fremont. Yeah. These demand oscilloscopes reproduce the entire range of the human voice. And they measure the base response, medium range, and high ends. What are high ends? You'd call them high frequencies. The machines accurately analyze any sound. Two sounds may appear absolutely identical to the human ear, but the machine can separate the component parts that go to make up the sounds. Understand? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> oh, sit down, please. Captain. Thanks. Oh, no, thanks. I'll just stand here. Now, the alpha sounds, the recording you brought into court, will appear on this screen. The beta sounds, the recording you made of Blaine's voice in jail, will appear on this screen. Start the first recorder, please. You are now watching a graph of the voice introduced as testimony at the trial. The beta recording, please. Now you're watching a graph of the voice of Mr. Blaine, the one you made in his cell. It looked the same to me. I sure couldn't tell the difference. Watch, gentlemen. I will now reproduce both recordings. You are now watching images of the whole speeches from both recordings. 
There are differences in the speech components, like with your fingerprints, Captain. Let me show you. I've taken a sample word from each of the two recordings. The single word, cigarettes. Now, let me show you both those images. Martin? This is the voice you brought into the courtroom. This is the voice you recorded in jail. As you can see, gentlemen, the two images are not the same. The imitation of Blaine's voice was an excellent one to the human ear. But the high frequency sibilance is much less pronounced in this beta recording. This indicates a decided difference in mouth cavity and teeth separation. The two recordings couldn't possibly have been made by the same man. You sure, aren't you, Doc? The equipment can't possibly lie. Artie Blaine could be innocent. Yeah. Brother, what a mess. Now, what do we do, Jim? We start all over again, Jake. Review all the evidence and the testimony. First, we have to find the guy that made this recording. You better turn the town inside out. Hit the nightclubs, theaters, booking agents. I want to run down on every performer that does imitations. And pick up that little tramp, Candy Mouth. Okay. Oh, Jim. The newspapers will think this is a phony. They'll claim there was a payout. Yeah, I know. Laura Barton said I was going to be afraid of the truth. Get going, will you, Jim? Hello, Doctor. Artie Blaine's got a lot to thank you for. So have I. We got trouble. That girl we planted in the police file room, she's come up with one. Get to the point. The cops are looking for Candy Mouth Duggan. Fremont wants to question him again. Why? I've tried to find out. Everybody's clammed up. Don't wait to find out. Get to Duggan. Get to him first. I'll expect to read the results in the morning papers. All right. Customer. Oh, well, sure. Why not? Come on in, buddy. There you are. Whoa. Oh, bottle? Are you kidding, me? Oh, bottle? What happened to you? Something good, huh? Oh, girl, huh? Uh, do me a favor, will you, Mel? Uh, my hand's a little shaky for that first one. Huh? Sure, pal. Maybe I ought to feed it to you, too. I know. I I gotta start tapering off. I... I'm sorry, no. Come here. You don't have to worry about it. Just sit there and take it nice and easy. There you are. Thanks, it's okay, pal. Just get happy. Thanks. Thanks. 
Let me talk to Harrison. Yeah, it's Milk. Hello, Harrison. He's here. Yeah, no, he's in the back room. Don't worry, I'll keep him there. Listen. Please. Just not around here. Check it all the way through, Jed. What good? Nothing. Not a thing to tell us whether Duggan wanted onto the tracks or fell off the viaduct. Or got himself pushed off. Could have been anything. Medical examiner said he had a skin full of whiskey. Oh, that figures too. Yeah. Lieutenant Trainer's here to see you. What's it about? Oh, he's working on the imitators. Well, send him right in. Come in, Lieutenant. Captain? What do you got? Well, I don't know whether it's much. A fellow named Kerry Jordan. He works at a place called the Green Dragon Cafe. Made a back deposit of $500 June 28th. It's the last week of the trial. We've been able to check back a few years. It's the biggest deposit he ever made. Any record? I reform school twice. Salt and battery in Detroit. Slugged the cafe manager. Charges were withdrawn. The manager needed him in the show. Jordan's supposed to be pretty good. That answer anything for you? Just the date of the deposit. You know, Duggan might have been killed because of a leak someplace. Can you pick up the Clarkson girl without putting a report through the department? Yeah. Okay, we'll screen everybody on the force right down to the janitors. Handle that trainer and handle it right. Kerry Jordan. Now what? Now we'll find out if Blaine knows anything about this guy. This guy does imitations. His name is Jordan. Jordan? Jordan? The name doesn't do a thing. Well, try to think back. This couldn't have been too long ago because it must be somebody you talked to. He'd have had to heard your voice to do the imitation. Oh, I've met and talked to a lot of entertainers. Just because a guy does imitations, there's no reason why it should stick in my mind. Maybe you could bring this Jordan in here. I'd recognize his face. What do you think, Jay? No. Oh, be a sure tip off blind. They'd run so far for cover, we'd never catch up with him. He's right. Laura. Laura and I went everywhere together. Maybe she'd recognize this Jordan. Yeah. Guard? Jake, get a hold of Laura Barton and have her meet me at that Green Dragon place tonight, 8.15. Give it a try. <laughs> Seems to say, uh -huh. wait a minute, folks. I said, wait a minute. You ain't had nothing yet. <laughs> now, who else would you like to hear? Do Robinson. Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> Edward G. Robinson? Okay. <laughs> All right, you guys, outside. Remember, I'm top man around here when I say goes. Yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah. Help me this way, please. 
Lou Carey Grant. I tell you, I love you, Judy. I'll get you kissing somebody else. I will punch you, Judy. That's right. I'll be punching Judy. You look familiar? Well, now we, we invite you to dance, folks, and uh, I'll see you later. When I return, I'll be back. Everybody dance. <laughs> Jordan. You run now, they'll be sure that you're the one they want. Stay there. Go out and do another show. All right. No, I won't talk to him. Okay, I'll wait here. But you better think of something good if there's trouble. Hotel over a waterfront saloon. Here's the address. Shanghai Low. A real joint. Okay, tell Jack to stay out of there. I'll handle this myself. Okay. Waiter. Give me the check. Please You lucky people. Anybody at all? Just sing it out. Sir Jimmy Durante. Durante? All right. Jimmy Durante. Nothing. The more I think, the less I the less I can remember where I could have seen him. Do rate me so rotty do. Oh, go. Well, let's get out of here. Do run ten ten. I can't bark like a dog, but I can howl like a wolf. That wolf joke, he's used it before. Oh, I remember now. It was at the Elliott home. There was entertainment, and he was there. He kept talking to Artie. He was very interested in him. Oh. When was the party? It was two days before Mickey was killed. Well, that's about it for now, folks. Uh, why don't you all dance? Do Artie Blaine! Do Artie Blaine. <laughs> Business? What's it to you? Well, you got a warrant? Want me to get one? Second guard. Thank you. Clarkson's still alive. Come on. 
You know that plane ain't gonna wait all night. Park it in the back. Wait for me. Follow the dame. I'll get word to Harrison about him. What do you have? Scotch. Hi, honey. Buy me a drink? Yeah, sure. Give her a uh, scotch on Yeah. Get rich. <laughs> they got a nerve. Who wants to work on a crummy saloon in Manila? What's the difference? All you got to do is learn how to say buy me a drink in Spanish. I only know one word in Spanish. See. Si. Yeah. <laughs> Honey, that's one word you'd better forget. <laughs> hey, that's good. What's with them? Are you taking a trip? Oh, who cares? Me? I like it here. So I've been looking for Sylvia. Sylvie, you know where she is? Baby, you're with me. Buy me another? Be my guest. What's the matter? That guy out there at the bar. Don't you know who he is? No. Well, who is he? Just the state's attorney. Fremont? Looking for somebody? Yeah, a friend. I'm friendly. Yeah, I know, but I'm, uh, I'm supposed to meet Sylvia. Oh, that new fancy dame. Yeah, you know where she is? I don't remember so good. She's in a room upstairs. Fourteen. Those stairs will get you there. I told you I didn't want to go. I got friends here. You think your friends can keep you from having your head caved in? Say we talk. Don't move, mister. I'll go for you, too. Stay put. Now outside. All right, you come on. You're coming with me. Come on! No! No, I'm not going anywhere. Get out! Here. You perjured yourself on the stand. You lied. No. No, I, I didn't. You can't prove I did. You lied. A man's gonna die because of that. I don't want any more trouble. Get out! Get out! You're scared, aren't you? You're really scared. They told you they'd kill you if you didn't testify against Blaine, didn't they? That's it, isn't it? Isn't it? No. No, I told the truth. Oh, you did? Well, we happen to know that that tape recording was a fake. How do you think they're gonna let you live with what you know? What do you mean? I mean, they killed Candy Mouth. They just killed the man that made the recording. Now, who do you think's gonna be next? No. No. You're trying to trick me. You wanna take a look at the bodies in the morgue? They said they'd let me go when this is over. They said they'd let me go. You admit they threatened you. <laughs> Mr. Fremont, I don't want Artie Blaine to die, but... Well, if they killed all those other people, what chance have I got? You've got police protection. Nothing can happen to you.
What do you want me to do? I want you to tell me the truth. I want you to tell me how they forced you to testify against Blaine. I want a full statement. Well? All right. Look. This is my home address. You go there and wait for me. So back way out of here? Hmm. Yeah. Take a cab. Come on. Send her on ahead to my house. I gotta get to a phone call, Jake. Come on. she is. about Jordan. Just get over to my house. Yeah, my house, quick. Jim! Hey, you all right? Jim, your face! Where's Sylvia Clarkson? Jim, what happened? Now you answer me, where is she? Did she get here? 
About five minutes ago. Hey. What's going on here? I found the Clarkson girl. She told me she'd talk. I sent her over here for safekeeping. I'm trying to find out what happened to her. A couple of men forced their way in. She fought them, and I tried to help, but they said they'd kill me if I interfered. I could see they had Laura Barton in the car outside. They took both girls. Where? I don't know. Did they say anything, anything at all? Well, the Clarkson girl was screaming. There was something about a plane. I'll call headquarters and have them ground every outbound plane. Jim, I'm going to get you to a doctor. I have to go with Jake. Don't. Helen, if anything happens to those women, I'm responsible. I'm responsible. Use every car in the area. Get right on it. Jake. Yeah. Send a squad car to the Fremont house. I want it covered. Cars 104 and 109, emergency. Proceed to airport. Car 104 reporting. We're on our way to the airport. Keep in touch with the control tower. I want to make sure no plane leaves the ground. Where are we stopping first? San Diego. We refuel there. Where do you pick up the other plane? Hey, what Tyson are doing here? Does Smitty and Duncan get here yet? No, where are they supposed to? Get those women off the field. What? Out of the plane and into that bus. Okay. Take them into town, spread them around, drop them anywhere. Sure, boss. What's up? Is the flight canceled? You worry about that. You just be ready to take off. Or two. We'll tell you later. Now warm up the motors. Get the lead out. Come on. Get out of the plane. I'm killing everybody, Harrison. Someday they're going to catch up with you. On the plane. What do we do with them? Lose them. Lose them, do you understand? So long as they're alive, we're in trouble. Then you and Duncan get out of the country. Out of the country? Fremont's wife saw you. What do you want to do? Hang, now get going! No! No, please! We're not going to get out of here, Mr. Harrison. Why not? The control tower has ordered every plane grounded. You taking your orders from me or from the control tower? Now get this crate in the air! I'll lose my life. You still I don't want to argue. Now get going. Cops. Cars 104, 107. Block the runway. Them up ahead. They're getting away. Hang on. They're gaining on us.
Ken Harrison, badly wounded, lived for three days. Before he died, he gave the police and state's attorney, James Fremont, enough information to completely crush the crime organizations set up by the Union monsters. Artie Blaine, cleared of complicity in the Parter's murder, regained the presidency of the WNB in a unanimous vote. And on James Fremont's desk was proof that the high offices of our land cannot be corrupted if men of courage are willing to fight for what is right and decent.